Hello and welcome back to Akansha. And today I'm flying solo and let's dive into the big game we saw on Sunday where Real Madrid faced Sevilla. Sevilla coming up an impressive win against Wolfsburg. They went to the Bernabeu and in the first half, they were the better team. They played the better football. They pressed Real Madrid. Real Madrid were unable to get out there half at times. So they were unable to press Sevilla at times. And when they did try to press Sevilla, Sevilla went out of the press comfortably. But in the second half, Real Madrid improved as the game went on. And, and they started to really pressure Sevilla. And it really told after like 77 minutes, especially when Carlo Chelsea made made a couple of brilliant substitutions. And that was the substitution of Camavinga, the substitution of Fede Valverde, bringing him into the game. It gave Real Madrid a bit more energy. They were able to drive at Sevilla a bit more. They were able to put a lot of pressure on Sevilla. And, and you could sort of feel it was cracking. And then... Before you know it, with the game clock running down, Vinicius Jr., what an impressive goal. That's an amazing goal. And I think that's the one thing he hadn't had in his locker for this season, the ability to score such a world-class goal. And that was what made the difference. And it's big. It's a huge statement win for Real Madrid because this is a month where Madrid are going to play Inter Milan, Athletic Club, Atletico Madrid at home, Rasa Sudan away from home. And in all these big games, like if they do come out of this and they're still on top and they have a sizable gap over either Atleti, Sevilla, or maybe even Barcelona, you'd expect that they go on from here and they win the title. Like they're not, like they will be heavy favorites for this. But that's, and a win like this sort of strengthens the case, sort of gives them more momentum, more confidence going into the tough parts of the season. As for Sevilla, there were a lot of questions about whether the mentality of Sevilla is good. Like the stats are there. They haven't won at the Bernabeu, the Camp Nou, or the Metropolitano or the Vicente Calderon for close to a decade now. And it's sort of questions like, is, is it that Sevilla, they don't have the mentality to win in these stadiums? And I'll say with recent performances, I don't think so. Because when they have gone to the Camp Nou last season, they went there and they performed really well. And maybe the draw was the fair result. When they went to the one match of Bertano, I felt they should have won earlier this year. And in this game at the Bernabeu, I think you it'll be hard to find another team that dominated Real Madrid the way they did. And maybe another Spanish team, maybe teams around the continent can do that. But another Spanish team that dominated Real Madrid for large portions of the game I think it's hard to find another team like that. And they did get beat by a moment of quality from Vinicius Jr. So, yeah, like maybe they haven't won this game. So we can tell that they're getting closer and closer to winning these games. And at home, they have been strong. They beat Atletico Madrid at home famously last season. And they also had a good record against Real Madrid before Zidane came in. And on Lopetegui, I feel, I feel he made the right decisions, but maybe he could have kept... Or Dan or Rakitic on for a lot longer because once both of them went off, they lost control of the midfield and then Real Madrid began to pressure. And that was the issue for them. And also, he might have refreshed the attacking lineup a bit, but his hands were a bit tied because Lamella was out and also Suso was out. But yeah, like I, I feel from this performance, if Real Madrid do slip up in any of the big games that are coming their way, maybe Sevilla would have a chance to fight for the title. But Sevilla, they also have big games coming their way as well in this month because they have that crucial tie against Salzburg, which they have to win to progress to the next round. They have home games against Villarreal, Barcelona, Atletico Madrid, and they also have an, a tough away game against Athletic Club. So it's not an easy period for them as well. So... We'll see, we'll see how they do and how Real Madrid do. And moving on to Atleti and then the game they had against Cardiff. In the first half, I, Atleti fans must, might have been nervous. It didn't really start that well, following up from what happened midweek in the Champions League, where in Milan, I felt Atleti were a bit disastrous, to be honest. I would have expected Atletico Madrid to really go for it because... If they had won that game, they would have put themselves in a very comfortable position going into the game at the Dragao, where they only need they only need a point to go through, but now they need to beat Porto as well as hope 
Milan doesn't beat Liverpool by a good scoreline. And this is a Liverpool side that might not be too interested in winning for winning's sake, so we don't know. And Simeone sort of shot himself in the foot in the later stages of the game, going for a point and signaling to everyone that, like, I'm going for the 0-0 when he should have been more combative. He should have been going for the win. And that's something that's I feel in the big moments has let Simeone down. But then again, I don't understand the calls for Simeone out because this is a manager, right, who's given Atleti the best period of their history possibly. And the only other time where they were this good and competing high up in the table was between the 60s and 70s. And now they've won two leagues in eight years. They've won as many leagues as Real Madrid in Simeone's four seasons. So he deserves a lot of credit and he should have a lot of credit in the bank. And in the second half of this game, he showed tactical flexibility. Because although the lineup was the same, the variation was very different. For example, Koke sometimes will go into the right back spot while Llorente went into center of midfield and Lemar played as a right winger. And they swapped throughout the game. And I saw things that made me feel that this team can improve. Like they're beginning to get it because they scored a goal from cross, which Atletico almost never do from cross and the header. And they did that by getting numbers into the box. And they never do that. Most times the forwards are usually isolated. And I feel this was also the best game of Griezmann because he had an assist, he scored a goal. Also, Mateus Cunha, like I wondered why they bought him and when he missed that chance against Milan, but like he put me wrong. He came on, he gave an assist and he scored a brilliant goal. So maybe this is where things start to change for them. But Atleti, they need to produce more performances like this. And the Derby's coming up soon in about two weeks. So they need to get to their best level quick in order for Real Madrid not to run away with this title. Because it looks like Real Madrid will if Atleti can be at that level. And also, moving on from Atleti, what's going on with Real Sociedad? Because against Espanyol, uh, they didn't look like the Real Sociedad of old, and they haven't looked like it for the past week. Because even against Monaco, they got dominated in that first half. Maybe they should have taken a draw or won based on how they kept on knocking at the door. But this is a team that Although they've won a lot of games, they've been on DC for so long, they're not a team that creates a lot. They're a team that at home has less goals than games. And that's not something I feel for them to be able to sustain a league challenge, even a top four challenge, because I do think Barcelona will catch them based on the current form and how they're performing. And in this game, they can feel well aggrieved because Mateo Lajos he decided to be center of attention in this game. He, I think the ball interrupted, um, the ball hit him when Ross led were going on an attack. They score a goal. He seems okay when the play is going on, but for some reason, he decides to ignore the goal. And that really hurt La Real in not getting three points from this game. But now they find themselves four points of Real Madrid, but Real Madrid have a game in hand on Wednesday. And you would assume Real Madrid win that. So they're seven points away from the top. And at this point, you can see, feel that maybe they wouldn't challenge for La Liga this season. On the other hand, for Espanyol, like, they've been brilliant at home. They've won most of their games. They've only lost against Atletico Madrid. And I believe they've only had one draw. They've also beaten Real Madrid. And against Atleti, like, there was an argument that they should have had a point. So Espanyol, they're doing really well. I don't have as much issues as I did at the start of the season. They look like they might comfortably stay up, and, and that's good for them. And moving on to the Betis Levante game, Betis and Kwame Jimenez, I was super surprised to see that. Like when I was watching this game, like, he scored a hat trick. This is a player who is not known for his like goal scoring exploits, but like, as Pellegrini said in his conference, like whenever has been on the pitch, he always gives 100%. So it's good to see him like, scoring lots of goals. And Betis in general, it's good to see them. They've been really brilliant over the past, since the international break. They got over that bad hump that they had before the international break. And they're one of the two Spanish teams who are already through to the next round in European competition. The other five 
they have do or die ties and that shows how well they've grown in La Liga and in Europe under Manuel Pellegrini and we're seeing a bit of the best Betis possibly since the 2005 2004-2005 season and long may continue I do think they I do think they, they might catch La Real I do think they're a better team than La Real in terms of creativity in terms of just all round although La Real might dominate games and keep the ball more I do think Betis will eventually finish ahead of them and they both play in about two weeks so that's more motivations for that. The opponents, Levante, uh, it's ever since, honestly, it's been weird to see what's gone on with this club, to be honest, because they they were brilliant up until February when it got close to, they got to the semifinals of the Copa del Rey. However, unfortunately, they couldn't get to the final. And ever since then, it's just been a drop off, a total collapse. And Javier Pereira has been sacked. And it just makes you wonder, why did they sack? Why did they sack Paco Lopez? Because I feel like he's this sort of guy where you have to be patient with him. You have to be patient because he knows the club. He really loves the club. He's a good servant, and he he's the type of person that can bring, that can roll with the punches and that can help them stay up. Levante, I still I still kind of see them staying up. To be honest, they still have like it's they're not hopeless because. A lot of teams like Elche, Granada, they haven't really separated themselves from the chasing pack. And Alaves who aren't that far off. And it's it's just five points, which is which might seem like a lot for a team that's struggling, but it really isn't over the long a long term horizon. So I still see them staying up. They do have the squad to stay up, but it's just defensively they're shambles. And normally, like normally defensively they are shambles, but offensively they give more and it can create a lot and you didn't really see that after the first half and the second half they just totally collapsed and that's why he's been sacked and I, and I do agree with it I do think he's not done the greatest of jobs having a Pereira he's not really giving them that boost that they really need to continue to compete and yeah it's it's it'll be sad to see Levante go because like the they do bring a lot of vibrancy to La Liga, especially when they're playing well. But they have a lot of really good players that other clubs could deal with, like Ennis Bardi, maybe Morales, maybe um, Jorge de Frutos, Campania. And yeah, we'll see where what happens where these players end up if they do get relegated. Uh, the regional rivals, Valencia, they are not, they're doing better, but they're not doing all that better than them. And they chose Valas in this game. It's funny because in the last two games for Valencia, it feels like it feels like they're causing a stir against teams that they usually play with. The good thing for them is like defensively, Valencia are much better than in the start of the season and midway through the season or midway through the first round of the season. But in this game, they play against Rayo and Rayo, they were they did show a bit of grit in the second half, and maybe Rayo should have won it. And Valencia, like, there's, there's an issue, right? Because Guedes is now played as center forward. And that's mainly due to the fact that Maxi and Maranial are not given the goals that are needed. And that's an issue because you take out the best form of Guedes, like the Guedes we saw early parts in the season when he's playing as a winger and taking on people. And that's something that was a border last we need to fix going forward for them. But, like, so far, so good. They're not, like too far away from the European places. They're not in a relegation battle, so there's some improvement for Rayo. It might have been a setback, but next week, they're at home at the Vallecas, where they're really strong, and they're going to play against Espanyol, so that should be a really fun game. And going on with the theme of, like, poor Valenciano clubs, we have Villarreal, who I, I don't know what happens to them, because every time I watch them, I ask myself, like, why isn't this team further up in the table? Because I do feel they are a club, like, if they're doing well, it could be one of those teams that, like, denies Barcelona a chance of getting into the top four. But they've been a shambles as well this season. And it's mostly down to poor individual mistakes. While you can blame Unai Emery for not being ambitious enough, for not having a team that takes a lot of risks and attack, but you can't... It's difficult for a manager 
to do well when his players make the mistakes that we made in the Champions League, giving up that goal for Cristiano Ronaldo, or the mistake that Stupinian made for Barca's second goal. Because like at that point when Villarreal equalized against Barca, it looked like Villarreal were the team that's most likely to win. But that mistake like ultimately cost them and they gave away a silly penalty at the end. And yeah, like you can see for Xavi Hernandez that things have really started well for them. They might not have played well, but two wins, it, it's huge. And especially for a team that was struggling for wins, struggling for luck, it seems like the mentality is changing a bit. They really dominate games right now and they're playing the more or less the Barca way. And Abde, this kid, like this Moroccan kid, 19-year-old, he is the best player at the moment. Like he, whenever he comes on, he's very refreshing. He likes to take on people. He's fearless. He gets into the box. Like he's a guy who strikes fear into the hearts of defenders. And he was one of the main catalysts for that first goal because he just like go, has go at people, and that's refreshing to see. And it makes the squad more exciting. So I'm, I'm honestly excited to see how Xavi revolutionized this the team with this young team because he seems like he's. He's done a decent job so far, so let's not go overboard. But, yeah, it's it's, it's going to be interesting to see how he does with the squad, especially with the Champions League coming up, because they're sort of in a hard place, a rock and a hard place, because they, they have to go to Munich to play Bayern Munich, albeit in a stadium behind closed doors because of what's going on with the health crisis in Germany. However, like... It's still Bayern Munich, like because it's behind closed doors, and maybe because Bayern might have other things going on, they might not play a strong team, but it's still Bayern Munich. And it, I see this 50 50 in Barca going through to the next round or not. For Villarreal, they have to go away to Atalanta, and that's that's a difficult call, especially like because Atalanta they score a lot of goals, and Villarreal they make a lot of mistakes that plays into the hands of teams like Atalanta. And offensively, they're not as potent as they should be. So they need to get a lot of things going on. Like they need to improve a lot of things in order to advance in this group. And Unai Emery, he, he needs to work on the team because like something's not going on. And I wonder how long he stays in the job. Although like they did have just have an approach from Newcastle and Villarreal did their best to keep him. But I do wonder how long he stays in the job if things are still going on this way up until, let's say, the new year. Maybe he might not be at the job, but you'd expect them to improve. And, yeah, and another, like, another Valenciano team was Osuna, was, I'm sorry, another Valenciano team was Elche, and they had a new manager, Francisco, who watched the game against Osuna from the stands. Osuna, they've gone off the boil a bit. They haven't won in six games. And in, in some ways, maybe this was, like, a good middle ground point that both teams needed. As soon as they caught the bleeding of like losing games, and Elche, they really just needed a point to like cut the bleeding of the loss, especially after their shambolic performance last week against Betis. But this this is a point that I feel maybe does both sides some good, as Elche gets a new manager, and as soon as maybe they can just build on this point and try to start winning again. And Athletic, they're really struggling with wins to come by wins at the moment. They were in action against Granada, and this was surprisingly the same game. It had me on the edge of my seat for most of this, especially in the second half, when after Granada got into the lead in the second half, Athletic, they were trying to get they were trying to get the point and trying to get the win, and it was always on the edge of the, your seat stuff. And it was refreshing to see them play more risky style of football or more progressive style of football under Marcelino. And ultimately I feel they should have won the game, but they're still they're still struggling a bit to like get that consistently. They've had too many draws athletic. And with Granada, like I'm in two minds about them. Sometimes I look at them and I see part of what we enjoyed under Diego Martinez. Like for example in this game, Darren Marches was like brilliant. He was energetic he scored a good goal but yeah he went up injured and you wonder how much the loss of not having Darren Maxis be there on a regular basis not having Yane Herrera who scored against Russell Stad this weekend for Espanol not having Kennedy 
how much that's affected them because those three players last season they brought a new spark they were they were more dynamic and they were creative and that that's what led to seeing a good Granada but I do think Granada will struggle to stay up the season I really do because they they don't have that extra quality with the players that I mentioned that departed another team that I think will struggle is Alaves it was a they lost against Salta. It was a big win for Salta because they've gone so long without winning. And it was like under the snow, it was beautiful to watch, especially when the Spanish ESPN commentator said, oh, we have a Black Friday and now we have a White Saturday. I lost my mind on that. And maybe the snow played an impact in Salta winning because when Salta did get a penalty, I think Pacheco would have done better with the save if it wasn't for the snow. But all in all, good performance by Salta. They are finally winning. They, they had some good games against Barcelona and Villarreal, so this was coming. But yeah, like it's good to see Salta like cracking up. And because we do expect more from Salta, we do expect them to be a team that's challenging closer to Europa League spots. But in recent years, they haven't really shown that potential. So maybe it's our fault for expecting too much of them. And finally, in Spain, the, the game that's sort of the ugly document of the weekend is Setapi versus Mallorca. The less said about this game, the better. It seems that Mallorca, after getting their ass whooped against Rayo, really wanted to get back to basics, keep a strong line, not concede goals, and they achieved that. And Hitafe, who had been like really goal hungry in the past couple of weeks, they were goal shy today. Uh, they were goal shy over the weekend, and that's what led to this goal to draw. The only goal to draw of the weekend, can you imagine? And that's it for Spain. And let's fly over to Italy. And in Italy, Milan, we already mentioned them earlier in the show. They got a great result against Atletico Madrid. And now if they can beat Liverpool at home at San Siro, and they can beat Liverpool by, like, let's say, a goal, a goal or two and be as good as Atletico Madrid, they do go through. They dropped points against Sassuolo. They lost Sassuolo. And that's sort of a downer because now, because Inter won against Venezia, Inter went on a point from them. And I do think Inter eventually are going to like go over them and go over Napoli, even though Napoli, they thrashed Lazio this, this weekend for, by four goals to nil after disappointing results in the Europa League where they lost to Spartak Moscow. And I'm not sure if anyone's seen this, but the reaction of Spalletti to... Queen Victoria, when he, after the game, was brilliant because like, Queen Victoria went over for a handshake and Spalletti was like, no. But Spalletti did like, give a good explanation for why he didn't take the handshake because he was like, if a manager wants to shake me after the game, the manager should also be very welcoming like before the game. And that was something that Queen Victoria wasn't to Spalletti. And I think that's a good reason not to shake the manager's hand and it also goes to the point of like what happened between Simeone and Klopp and the point Simeone made for why he doesn't shake hands after a game because of that like egoism that's there after a game and maybe that's true like it's it happens sometimes but yeah uh with Napoli they're in a tight spot in the Europa League they need to win against Leicester which would be easy at home in the Diego Maradona Stadium and, but they're comfortable in Serie A. They're four points off Inter. I do think Inter will claw back and eventually win it, but football is there to surprise us and make idiots of all of us. So let's see what happens there. Juventus, they lost to Atalanta. And Juve, uh, they're seven points off the top four. Atalanta are right there with 20, 28 points. They're three points ahead of Roma. But with Juve, it's, it's difficult for them to like, win the Scudetto in the first place. But... Now it might even be difficult for them to get into the Champions League next season. And there are rumors about investigations that are coming up in the pipeline, and that's like it's it's crazy what's happening in that club. And you just think a couple of years ago, four years ago, they were like just on the edge of like getting that Champions League win, that win that they've desperately wanted ever since 1996. And it doesn't look like it's going to come anytime soon. They might be in a drought where they don't win the Champions League for 20 years. And it's sad to see what's going on there, especially when you look at the image they gave in the Champions League. Losing Fornio to Chelsea, I believe that was their, that was their worst loss in over 18 years or something. And it's, it's just a really sad image right now. But the good thing for them is they are through in the Champions League. So 
and they can maybe still win the group. So, like, we'll have to see what goes on with which kind of opponent again in the round of 16. Uh, yeah. And speaking of Chelsea, they had a big game in England. It was all square against Manchester United. Jorginho made an error, but he made up for it with a penalty goal. And with United, they have a new manager, the king of so called king of pressing, Ralph Ragnick, the godfather of German coaching. And yeah, like this result must might have given him some impetus, see how he can improve the team, because they were also decent against Villarreal. They got their job done without being spectacular. And they're through to the Champions League as group winners, which is huge because you might avoid the tough coconut sub to draw for it to say. And yeah, like that's that's something that we'll keep an eye out for. Liverpool strong again, they were strong against Porto. Thiago Alcantara scored a brilliant goal against Porto. And Liverpool, like, they thrashed Southampton this weekend. City also won. So it's very tight up there in England with three teams separated by, I believe they separated by one point. So that's interesting to see. In Germany, the top two are also separated by a point. Holland scoring it on his debut. And it was interesting to see when he celebrated. And he did that, like, funny celebration to the crowd. And the lady gave him the international or European sign for get out. That's the PG version of that. <laughs> you can think of it where you will. Bayern, they left it a bit late to win. And it's tight because like the class goes around the corner. So Dortmund's at home. Dortmund, they got knocked out of the Champions League after losing to the Sports in Lisbon, which is a tough blow for the club. They have to go to the Europa League, but I don't think that might be too much of a burden for them because it means that it can focus on the Champions League. Financially, it's a tough hit, but sporting wise, it's like the Europa League is a weaker competition with all due respect. So maybe they might not have to play the best teams every week until the, the later stages of this tournament. And it can focus all their eggs on the Bundesliga. And it would be nice if they beat Bayern to the title, but it is Bayern Munich and it's their birthrights almost to win the Bundesliga. <laughs> and moving on over to France with PSG. Uh, they won at Saint Etienne, Messi with a hat trick of assists. And Sergio Ramos also made his debut. So it's good to see Ramos back. And by all accounts, he had a good debut. Messi scored his first goal last week. This week, he had a hat trick of assists. So he's getting really comfortable in his surroundings in France. And finally, in Portugal, we saw the most bizarre game of the weekend because it was Belenenses against Benfica and Belenenses they had a huge uh, COVID outbreak I said the match first uh, and then they had to play a game with I believe only seven outfield players Benfica were winning the game by 7-0 and the game was forced to stop with like was forced to stop after one player got injured and I just think this is a total farce right because if a team can get enough players to fill an 11 lineup, the game shouldn't go on. It really shouldn't. And it can always be rescheduled. So I don't know why the authorities in Portugal decided that this game had to go on. But it's just one of those weird things that happens in like leagues like in Italy or Spain or in Portugal. Like you see all these strange things going on. And I think that might be because of the transparency issues that all three of those leagues suffer from. Because, like, I'm, I'm not saying they're bad leagues. Like, I do love the Spanish league and I do love the Italian league. But it would be nice if there was more transparency within those leagues to see what's going on. And that's it for me for this week. I hope you enjoyed another episode. If you did, please like, subscribe, wherever you are. I won't be doing this podcast in the following weeks because I will be going to Spain and over there I really want to just enjoy and have a nice vacation, but I'll be doing some vlogs, hopefully, depending on the health situation. If I go to a stadium, so I might do a vlog and I may post it on Instagram and on Twitter. So if you want to keep up with my adventures in Spain, you can always follow me there and hope you have a wonderful week and enjoy your football. Adios and see you soon.